and hi everyone it's kind of uh, you know confusing to know whether to say good afternoon good evening uh, in this in this scenario so i'll just stick to hi everyone as suvankar said uh, i have a book called math and architectures of deep learning you are welcome to buy it it costs 60 dollars i get 6 dollars out of that so if you buy the book i'll buy you coffee and you're even I am pretty sure the authors in the audience, uh, this is resonating with them. But let's get into the main subject matter. Is my screen visible properly? Yes. Are you, are you able to see my screen? All right. So as we all know, manufacturing has been around for a long time, 100 plus years. So real, what we call mechanical manufacturing really started with steam engine which was in some sense replacing the muscle power of animals and human beings with the first machine arguably the first machine namely the steam engine from that like more than 150 years ago we reached the era of electricity based mass production in the mid 20th century which actually enabled us to increase efficiency seriously by, uh, by using electrical motors. Then we came to the era, I would date this era around the 1980s, 1990s, maybe 70s, even 2000 is the fag end of it. This era, we computers started taking a lot of the repetitive and works out of the hands of the human. If you notice each of these eras were marked by something, something taken out of the human's jurisdiction. So in this era, the repetitive works uh, were largely taken out of the humans. Now we are rapidly approaching an era where more higher level decision-making is kind of being done by machines. So basically, uh, in one sense, we are, the computers are beginning to close in on white collar workers. I don't mean to make this a scary article at all. And there are things further down the line which will address the scare aspect of that. But basically, we are trying to make this is the era of the AI, where we are trying to make the computer take a lot of decisions things that a relatively senior uh, operator on the floor would take. What here are some examples of such decisions? So the first one of the things we can uh, automate is the predictive maintenance. Basically think of it as machines that have the intelligence to know when they're sick and they might emit a warning light saying i need to go for a maintenance i am not doing so well there are other things demand prediction and intelligent supply chain uh, you know as a, a manufacturing setup constantly needs its supplies of materials and uh, i uh, and and getting them right moving them in the right time from the right place is actually a fairly complex pro problem which is often done ad hoc. I, in fact, have a kind of funny story from my last uh, employer, Flipkart, where they had warehouses and there, there were umbrellas. And in one of their cities, to be very specific, Chennai, they ran out of umbrellas. And they actually moved all their umbrellas from, their, from a warehouse in another city, Calcutta, to the warehouse in Chennai. And within two days of that, the monsoon arrived in Calcutta. So they, somebody was, I guess, was really wrapped on the knuckles for getting all the umbrellas out of the city where monsoon was about to arrive. This kind of thing can be simplified a lot, at least can be automated a lot. We can actually look at the demand patterns and predict how many May, how many and what needs to be stocked in these warehouses. This is what I meant by demand prediction and intelligent supply chain. 
Then there is the evergreen computer vision problem, quality product inspection. Basically, as a product comes out of the assembly line, we need to check it up for scratches, marks, other deformities, which should not go out into the world. That would damage the reputation of the manufacturer. And computer vision has been, there are companies such as Cognex that actually inspect finished products. They install a camera at the end of the assembly line uh, and the camera actually investor looks at the finished product and checks for uh, deformities. This type of a thing also has been around for a while, although in the recent times, the computer vision is essentially going through a titan a tectonic uh, shift. Uh, pretty much everything that could be done by other means are now being taken up by neural networks. So this, since there were older te techniques here, many companies are in the transition. Some of them are, are using partly old, old style methods, uh, partly neural network methods, but this is, this is still a very valid part of using AI in manufacturing. And then finally, there was a gap in all of these, which is what my company Drishti is trying to uh, address. That gap um, is, you know, if I give you an iPhone and ask you how many human hands and how many robotic hands touched the iPhone during its manufacture, I bet a large number of you would actually say it was mostly touched by robotic hands. The answer, as I knew two years, three years ago, is actually zero robot and 100% humans. What I'm trying to say here is that, really speaking, a lot of manufacturing is still done by people, work done by people. And what is the big problem with people? there are many advantages with people. They are creative, they find better ways of doing things, but they have one big disadvantage compared to machines. The quality of their work undergoes, uh, up, it goes up and down. They make mistakes, they get tired. As a result, there is a big scope for using AI to exactly inspect these things. In other words, my company Drishti installs video cameras on the factory floor and these cameras actually are looking at the people. We take various steps to anonymize as per the client's request, such as face burying, et cetera, uh, to protect privacy. But we are basically looking at whether the speed of unit movement is faltering. This is to say cycles are getting slower. We also take steps, a uh, look at the uh, time taken to complete individual actions. Yes, our uh, technology does action detection. In fact, it's one of the best action detection engines in the planet. Uh, we uh, do these and we check if the speed is faltering, if actions are taking longer, or we give real time warnings if a specific action was missed out or somebody did it in a wrong sequence. You know, sometimes industries have actions that have to be performed in exactly a fixed sequence. And if somebody uh, went out of sequence, we can emit real-time warnings. So overall, we look at quality of work and productivity of work. So at this point, I would like to take a small detour and try to give a redux of neural networks, how do they do these things? This is, uh, I, I'm not going to give, a, you know, uh, give out any of the new research that my company is doing. I can't do that. But I have noticed, uh, especially because I'm writing a textbook on the topic, the new idea can be really concisely presented in a very geometric fashion. It's a beautiful picture to keep in the head and it's surprisingly lacking sometimes even among practitioners of the trade. As a result, I will just devote three to four slides to kind of giving a what I believe is the 
neatest over uh, neatest uh, mental model to have for neural networks so this is what i am going to go for i call this deep learning in a nutshell uh, and, and and this is like four slides i believe let's take one of the problems we just discussed predictive maintenance so there will be a bunch of inputs uh, in this simple toy example, we are saying the input is temperature and sound. Basically, if the sound is, you know, kind of unhealthy, uh, let's not get into too much detail here. By sound, you can tell whether a machine is actually not well. So we will have a two variable input based on which there will be some function as yet unknown that emits a variable y y can take only two values zero which means no maintenance needed and one maintenance needed so this is roughly the function f is what the neural network would try to uh, emulate try to uh, model we will uh, we will have very high level overviews of how that is done in a moment let's take another example this time there are four variables and this is the demand prediction problem we are trying to predict how many units of a certain merchandise would sell for that we will use now we have always we are using simplified toy problems in real life these problems will have many more input dimensions but as a toy let's say uh, we will be able to predict the demand based on number of units sold last week what is its price what is the discount offer and number of days to the next big festival which could be diwali or christmas based on all this there is a function f remember once again we do not know the function f we are going to we are going to kind of estimate the function f uh, 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 based on this we will emit y which is the number of units sold so the point is any set of input values can be described as a vector and any vector can be described as a point in a high dimensional space. In the first case, problem one, it is a two dimensional space. In problem two, it's four dimensional space. So the input is a vector in a four dimensional space. And in many cases, we will have a large number of dimensions. Thousand dimensional spaces are not uncommon. But the, for illustrative purposes, we will stick to two dimensional uh, situation. So this is the uh, this is kind of like the uh, like the predictive maintenance problem. There is noise and there is temperature on the two axes. This is the input space. Now, for machine learning to succeed, the classes have to be somewhat organized. In other words, there would be one region in the input space which corresponds to one class. In this case, for example, the red region corresponds to uh, maintenance required class. You can think, see that temperature is higher in the red region and noise is also higher. So a machine making too much noise and uh, having too much temperature is probably up for maintenance. Remember, these are toy examples. And if both temperature and noise is low, we are in the green region. And uh, no maintenance is called for. Essentially, the goal of the neural network we are trying to build would be to classify, would be to create a boundary between these two regions. Remember, we don't actually have the expressions for these red and green regions. Here we have shown a diagram, but in real life, we, are, we have no idea in that where in the regions are in the unknown high dimensional space. And yet, we have to create a boundary function separating the regions. Fortunately, it's a lot less difficult than it shows. We, will, we do not know these regions, but we can sample points in this region through a process called manual training data creation. Essentially, we would take, we would sample a combination of feature inputs. So we will sample a few points and check via human beings as to whether these really needed, which class do they belong to? In other words, this is manual training data. And 
we would actually create the decision boundary separating these sample training data. If the sample training data represents, kind of spans the proper space of all the training data, our decision boundary would be good. So here is an example of a bad set of sample training data. Remember that this blue line is the true set of a true decision boundary. That was this blue line. And it correctly separates the two classes. There is, there is a yellow region here which says, we, if we try to approximate this nonlinear blue curve with this single line, we would still be have a reasonably good classifier. Most of the green points would be, and the red points would be classified, but the region yellow, which should have become green, will now be classified as uh, red. So these yellow points, but it's a very small fraction of all the points. It would still be not a bad machine if we approximate the nonlinear machine with the linear separator. Anyway, so here, since the training data was kind of biased, there should have been more training data in these empty regions. And due to their absence, we might end up with a, this orange line, which is not really at all representative of the true decision boundary, the desired decision boundary, which is the blue line. But if on the right hand side, on the other hand, we have a much better training data distribution and we end up with a good set of, uh, with a good classifier, even with the orange line, linear classifier would also perform pretty well. Of course, in real life, we have higher dimensions and hence the uh, decision boundary would no longer be a line. It would be a plane if it's a three dimension and at higher dimension, we would have end up with hyperplanes. Here are certain examples. So this, these are the two classes sampled data points that we are trying to separate. Here is a uh, top right, we see a bad decision boundary. It's not separating neatly because it has a wrong orientation. In the bottom left, the orientation is correct but its position is wrong. If we move it a little bit, we get a good classifier, which neatly satisfies, uh, separates out the red and the green points. And uh, we are almost done with this detour. Uh, essentially, one thing we just saw is a linear boundary. In the higher dimensions, it would be plain. For example, in 3D, <coughs> there is, it's possible to make a linear boundary separator that can, it kind of looks like this, right? The red side, we have value one and the green side, we have value zero. So one says machine needs to go for maintenance. Zero says machine needs to, uh, need not go for maintenance. And these are the uh, two uh, classes that the machine would output. And we can have a neuron which emits exactly this kind of a linear separator. If we need a more complex separator, we would have to combine many neurons. I'll leave it at that. This is called the multi-layer perceptron. We have to keep the neurons in organized in layers to make our job easier. But ultimately, it is a proven mathematical fact that by having enough neurons, we can mimic any complex decision surface in the world. This is why neurons are called neuron, meaning these machines, which essentially uh, in, in two dimensional, they essentially represent uh, a, a step function. And in three dimensional, the step looks like this. By combining large number of them and having a, uh, having a, a sigmoid uh, or a nonlinear function on top of that would allow us to mimic a very large variety of uh, all, all possible decision functions, which is what we are showing here. So this neuron with two, three, a combination of these like this, we can emit a square wave function. And many square waves together, we can actually mimic 
a complex boundary function like this. These are more for kind of the big picture taking scenario. So let's not get into the exact nature of the functions. So that ends our detour and let's come back to what we are doing. As I said, we are, we now by we, I'm, I mean Drishti. Drishti is into creating AI that actually watches the human being. In particular, it, uh, it checks the it, it checks the productivity and the uh, productivity and the efficiency of the uh, productivity efficiency and also the uh, correctness of the output. I already uh, spoke about this. Uh, this is kind of a motivation of why. Drishti chose to look at human beings. A lot of manufacturing is still in human hands. And people, as we know, are the ultimate source of all strength, as well as the ultimate source of all weakness. As a result, automation that focuses on people is something, It because of the extreme difficulty of the problem, technological difficulty, this was not touched in the early days of computer vision and even in the early days of deep learning. But uh, we have recently attacked that and uh, we are getting uh, pretty much state of the art results. Uh, I will uh, just mention some of the very deep technology inventions that has happened at Drishti. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not at liberty to go into details of this in a public forum. Uh, so basically among other things <coughs> we have, as we just saw, you know, one of the kind of not so cool things about machine learning is, machine learning, including neural networks and deep learning is that you have to generate a lot of manual training data. Only very recently, the trend has started to use minimal training data. We have an in-house invention and patent pending, uh, which uses a technology called uh, anchored variational autoencoders. Uh, and there is some work going, going on at Google based on this. Uh, we, have, uh, we have tweaked it to seriously improve their results. And uh, you know, Kingma uh, and uh, his, his lab folks are uh, general working on variational autoencoders in Google. So our paper would extend theirs and improve the accuracy by very significant uh, uh, amounts. And that gives us almost unsupervised. Supervision is the name for manual training data creation. So we need very small amount of manu manual training data and we can generate our results. Uh, in fact, I will show you some of those results and you will see what I'm talking about. Another mm, very deep technological innovation we have at Drishti is for action detection, uh, we use 3D convolution. 3D convolution is crunching space data. You know, in space means X and Y coordinates within the same image frame in a video. Third dimension is time. So the temporal dimension is successive frames of the video. Now, crunching all the three dimensions together gives us an unique advantage. Let me try to illustrate this with a simple point. If I show you a still photo, of a half open door, would you be able to tell me whether the door is closing or opening? It's very hard because you don't know which direction the door is moving. But if I show you a video of successive frames of half open, semi open, quarter open doors, you will be easily able to tell me what, whether the door is opening or closing because you're able to see the motion. This is fundamentally the reason why a 3D uh, <coughs> image, a 3D sequence has inherently more equation, and using that, we have been able to come up with much, much, uh, in fact, state of the art. Uh, we beat the state of the art in action detection accuracy. And now for some demos. 
I, I, I will just quickly recap some of the things I said just now. We have a proprietary, we don't work with off the shelf models. We have our own proprietary model architectures. They are all invented at Drishti and they advance the state of the art. We, in particular, we have uh, the almost unsupervised variational autoencoder technology for which we have patent pending and 3D convolution based action detection. Let's now look at some results. <clears throat> in particular. So the first thing I'm going to show you, it has no Drishti running. It's just a, a set of cycles happening in a factory floor. And just absorb what's happening here then I, uh, I will show you with this. Basically, you will see a few cycles. This, they are manufacturing some sort of car radiator and they are doing several actions during the cycle. They are removing, uh, they're inserting wires here and there. And I don't even remember the exact names of these actions. You will see our neural network real time what I'm going to show you is real-time output of a neural network. It's not a concocted video. So you can see cycle is going on and he's done, pushes the thing out. That ends that previous cycle and the new cycle has started. I, and th th that's pretty much all I wanted to show you on this one. Now let's go back to the next video. This time we will show the same thing, but annotated with Drishti neural network outputs. I will try to speak a little bit basically watch for the green rectangles which are neural network identified regions of interest and the, there would be a bit of text at the bottom uh, for example right now you are seeing the text cycle start so the neural network has identified that in this green rectangle cycle is starting and uh, the percent is the confidence value of the neural meaning the network is saying, uh, the deep learning network is saying, I'm 99% confident that a cycle has is starting right now. And then you will see every single action. We basically get the set of interesting actions from the client himself or herself. So we will just uh, uh, recognize, we would learn to recognize the client specified set of actions. Cycle has started, then there is a place spin fan. Spin fan action has happened. Then obtain packing paper, remove backing paper. And this is uh, press packing paper. This is align wire in sheet. And I couldn't read that. Uh, remove backing paper and install packing left. Press packing left white mark shout feet and cycle end and we have measured the cycle time to be 36.17 second so based on this we generate a large variety of analytics so you can uh, emit uh, <coughs> you can take high level decisions like wh why are my afternoon shifts slow or why is the factory in India slower than the factory in Japan and so forth. You know, those are, we have a portal which shows uh, many of the, those. Here is uh, another demo of a very different, this is a moving line. And you will see an engine is being manufactured here we, in fact, 
detect that there is one cycle that is going on right now on which we are identifying, we are tracking the moving unit and we are identifying the actions happening on that. Uh, you will see this guy is doing uh, install fuel pump or something which should tighten fuel pump bottom and uh, title fuel pump bottom and a title for, for there are a few actions like that the real uh, machine of interest is the next one that is walking in they this is a chosen video they would not for some reason perform any action on the next unit and consequently we would emit warnings in red saying that this unit had no actions performed and presumably there would be a line supervisor some sort of manager on the line, he would observe this and uh, you know come and see why nothing was done on this or is everything all right and so forth. So we have not recorded a single action on this unit so far. When it crosses the point of no return, we will flag the no unit detected, no action detected. <coughs> warnings in red. Yes, at this point, it has crossed the point of no return. And we say that this is a bad cycle. No actions were done. So, um, as you can probably tell, we are largely focused on industrial manufacturing activities. However, the main point I would like to make here is that the paradigms that we have invented are very easily extendable. And, uh, the, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a set of examples where uh, the paradigm, our paradigm of observing people and coming up with analytics uh, of, and, and identifying what they're doing and coming up with analytics on top of that, that paradigm can be extended in many different ways, which actually makes sense in smart cities. So in fact, the first one is something we are actually working with a German company. Uh, I understand that Germans are uh, planning to put cameras on buses and trains and they want to anonymously count the number of people uh, boarding and, and unboarding at each station. That data will be probably used for route planning and or optimal allocation of transport resources. You can't do this with ticket sale data largely because most of the tickets are they don't necessarily have a fixed start and end point. Tickets are mostly passes that just allow you to board the train for arbitrary distances. So this essentially boils down to installing cameras in the bus or the train and which is pointed at the board and you you you, manu you, you count the number of people getting up and down. This is not a very easy problem. People will be standing shoulder to shoulder, which makes it hard for counter uh, neur the neural network, which counts it and the viewpoints will be absurd. There would be perspective distortion, but yet it's a fun problem as well. We are actually trying to take a pot shot at it. And then uh, you can, on a very similar vein, you can do uh, queue length detection at kiosks. Basically, let's say uh, you, are a, uh, you are a mobile phone um, outlet and some of the people come in and do self-help and go out. You can have a camera to actually collect detailed analysis on how long it is taking for every person to get things resolved. And that could lead to a lot better planning. There are car, car counting for uh, through, uh, through important junctions for optimal traffic management. This is an evergreen problem. And Another evergreen problem, I am aware of more than one entities working on this, 
uh, uh, so automatic criminal activity detection from CCTVs, then, um, you know, compliance detection. This is something that our technology could do almost without too much hard work compliance. So for instance, there is a regulation that you have to, I don't know, wash your hands before serving food, before ch chopping onions, and at the back end of a restaurant, that sort of compliance can also be uh, tracked with the technology. And <clears throat> there is the retail store inventory management. This is also, there are startups coming up these days doing that. This is essentially a camera which constantly counts how many items of what brand are there on the shelves. And based on that, they can place refill orders and also, they can emit analytics on the rate of sales of various brands. Just for fun, let's just take a quick review of the system that would be needed to do the, uh, do the uh, onboard, uh, offboard counting of people in the trains and buses. First of all, we would need an AI-enabled camera, which actually collects and uh, crunches the video to generate the number of people. This is the distributed data collection. It's a combination of IoT and AI. This data is then sent to a backbone network, which collects and collates all the data. And this probably sits in the cloud. On top of this data, a second tier of AI would run, which is generating the analytic engine, which is generating the analytics on, you know, which station had how many and maybe generate bar charts and pie charts and stuff, which brings out whatever they want to see. And ultimately there has to be a display system, which shows all the analytics. The issue in all these, and we are facing some of these is privacy and end to end security. They are kind of linked, especially privacy is involved we have to, so one almost, uh, so GDPR, which is the, which is the European very strong privacy protection agency, they mandate that when you're collecting data like that, you have to blur the faces. Not only so, uh, I, I think uh, Googlers in the audience would know this very well. Not only so, the data, with the face, you cannot do the face blurring in the cloud because it, the face cannot even enter your own territory. So the face has to be blurred in the in the camera itself. What reaches our cloud is really the blurred data. We cannot, even if we wanted to, no Drishti worker would be able to see the uh, face of anybody. And the system, you know, it has to be hijack proof. So when it's traveling over the internet, it has to be secured enough to eaves, eavesdroppers, which means probably a, we, we are thinking of a VPN-like technology to do that. But despite all this, the future is bright. My personal feeling is that there will be years of hiccup, not necessarily at the core technology, which is where I work most of the time, but there would be hiccups in the periphery, in the in the junction of law and technology, there will be hiccups in the junction of public trust and technology. It would be a while before human beings trust these systems. And without the trust, it's useless. I, I, I strongly feel that, uh, that, that uh, which is why we took this very, this uh, face burning, et cetera, very seriously from the start in our company. So people have to feel comfortable with this or any other technology they use, otherwise they won't use it. But if all those constraints are met, the future is bright in my humble opinion. That's pretty much uh, all I had to say. And with that, I will give the uh, floor back to Subhankar. Thank you all for listening. Questions? Is there any question from the audience? Actually, there is one question I see in the chat box. 
how does it help with the productivity yes a uh, good question i was uh, hand wavy in that portion basically it helps with the productivity because remember we are measuring the cycle completion time that means we are knowing we can always uh, emit analytics saying you uh, we can give a private warning to a worker we actually provide a small handheld tablet to every worker in that tablet we can emit messages like okay you are going slower than the average today or you are slower than your own average compared to yesterday or the last week complete so or and we can even provide analytics of the following nature you are going slower and you are consistently being slower when you are tightening that far away nut over there so do something about it maybe pull it a little bit closer or this table needs a worker with longer hands that sort of things can be done meaning let's say something is kind of far away this actually has happened this is a real life example sometimes a worker is given a table which is too long for him or her and a longer worker wouldn't find it difficult uh, with longer hands but a uh, person with smaller hands are uh, would have difficulty they would have to walk and do it that takes us se several additional seconds that sort of productivity hint that's an example and uh, of course uh, bottlenecks which station is forming the bottleneck can always be identified that is a station with the longest cycle duration and we can say that this station probably is overloaded with too many action take some of the uh, assembly lines are like pipelines right uh, a set of actions in this table next table has the next set of actions sometimes the actions are not evenly distributed as a result the line will move at the speed of the slowest table which has the most number of actions and redistribution of the actions could make it a lot uh, more balanced and faster 